Hello everyone, I hope you're having a productive Friday, and today I'm going to give the lecture that I promised to give in my video on transhumanism, and that is uh, this lecture that I gave for senior credit in the last year of my undergraduate degree. Uh, I'm realizing now that I should have made a script when I first made this presentation, because when I first made it, I was in the material, uh, engaging with it for a few days prior to the presentation, and I didn't need a script, uh, so all the things that I say in between the slides, I just like was ready. And now I forgot all of those things. So if it looks like I'm just reading off the slides, my apologies, it's not normally how I present or try to present anyways. Um, I also wanted to mention before I start that the video that I made called Modernism is Stupid, that and I, I said in that video that that was sort of like one of my, the main aspects of my philosophy of how I like view the world. If that was part one, this is sort of part two. Um, this perspective on modern life informs a lot of the decisions I make and ways I engage with the world. So this is an important one, and I hope I do it justice. Um, so the central tenet of this presentation, I'm not gonna like tease you and make you wait till like minute eight to tell you what it is. <laughs> I'll just tell it to you right now. The, the central tenet is that modern life is bad because it alienates us from our biology and from the environment that we're adapted to live in. And in order to live a happy, fulfilling life, we have to reconnect with our biology in a holistic way. Okay, so this idea is also the central tenet of this book that I read to prepare for the presentation called Pandora's Sea. Um, Wells focuses more on the biology aspect of things, but uh, the, the idea is the same. And he points specifically to the Neolithic, Re Neolithic Revolution as being sort of like the the main point in human history that sort of shifts the tide from taking us from an environment that we're biologically adapted to and putting us into an environment that we are not adapted to, that's unhealthy. So I found this comic online, I thought it was pretty funny. Uh, I thought about like voice acting and like reading it to you, I don't know, <laughs> you guys can just pause the video and read it, uh, I'm not going to embarrass myself. Um, but. Yeah, like I said before, the central premise is that the Neolithic Revolution was the first and most substantial lifestyle change that has separated us from our hunting and gathering ancestors. And the evidence for the above statement lies in the significant negative effects that the Neolithic had and is having on our biology and psychology. Okay, I guess I should define Neolithic Revolution. Um, that's like when humans started farming, right? And like um, planting and uh, harvesting grains. Uh, and of course, when we started doing this, uh, we also stopped being like nomadic or semi-nomadic. We have to stay in the same place um, and start building cities and so on because the food doesn't move, right? <laughs> so uh, I just wanted to quickly contrast traditional life with modern life. So traditional Paleolithic life, right before we started farming, uh, humans had limited possessions, right? Because they're nomadic or semi-nomadic. Um, we lived in small, tight-knit communities. Everyone was essentially self-employed. Uh, you had a healthy diet of whole, non-processed foods, uh, lots of exercise, and people were self-sufficient. Um, and self-sufficiency has a lot to do with uh, mental health and the ability to feel competent uh, in addressing the world's challenges, uh, life's challenges. Uh, so that's important as well. Now, one thing I also wanted to address is that all hunter-gatherers died young. Okay, um, People seem to have like this view of cavemen where they're like super stupid and like ran around just getting like absolutely bored by like wild buffalo and like killed by lions uh <laughs> and of course i mean humans are prey for some some animals but if you exclude child mortality 70 percent of hunter gatherers live past age 45 and it was not uncommon to reach age 70. um as our societies get more and more modern 70 might seem like kind of young um but hey it's better to live like a short well-lived life than a long life of misery. So that's what I would say to that. Um, and then I wanted to contrast this traditional life against the modern life. So uh, in modern society, we have increasing amounts of technology, uh, urbanization, right? People are moving into cities, globalization, right? Sort of like a homogenous culture. Everyone's sharing ideas with the internet. Um, population increase, industrialization, materialism, and bureaucratization. Uh, so all these evil things that are occurring. And again, they're evil because 
we're not adapted to them. And so we find ourselves in over time in a more and more foreign environment that our brain doesn't know how to deal with. Uh, here's a quote from the book. One of the great myths surrounding the development of human culture over the past 10,000 years is that things got progressively better as we moved from our hunter gathering our hunter gatherer existence into the sublimely elevated state in which we live today. Right? Sort of this like wig account of history where things were bad and awful and life was nasty, brutish and short. Uh, and then thanks because of science and technology and these great people called scientists, we are able to like live these live this amazing life that's like totally removed from the natural state. And it is removed from the natural state, but it's not sublimely elevated. <laughs> okay. So, like I said before, this presentation might focus more on the biology side of things just because it was prepared for a biology class. Um, so, one of the biological consequences that's the most obvious is diet, right? I mean, if you're hunting and gathering, how often do you find a nice hamburger and some fries laying on the forest floor? <laughs> so, the two major changes in our diet has been quantity, so number of calories, and quality, types of food. So in terms of quantity, uh, we have this idea called the thrifty genotype hypothesis. And I think this hypothesis has been like um, criticized recently, but I think it still has some merit, right? The idea behind the, th the thrifty genotype hypothesis is that humans are adap adapted for long periods of time, surviving with low caloric intake. Um, and they're able to do this by having improved fat storage systems, right? So when you start cultivating crops and farming, this has the potential to yield vastly more calories with less effort, okay? Because obviously you don't have to hunt down your wheat, it's just like in the field. And the increased availability of calories caused Neolithic farmers to develop higher rates of metabolic disorders, including diabetes, obesity, uh, etc. And obviously, <laughs> the problem is much worse nowadays, right? The hunting and gathering that people do nowadays is going to Safeway and getting um, <laughs> dino dinosaurs and like those really bad fish sticks <laughs> um and it's getting even worse right because you can order like instacart uh we just they bring it to your house and you don't even have to do anything right um, in terms of the quality of food other gatherers consume relatively large quantities of wild game and uncultivated fruits and vegetables but few grains and all food was most importantly unprocessed um of course modern diets are very nutrient poor high in calories, and highly processed, and also very carb-heavy, right? Uh, one interesting factoid that I found in Wells' book was that there's something called the Big Three, and this is that wheat, rice, and corn account for more than half of all calories consumed in the world today, which is crazy. Um, so yeah, diets have become a lot less diverse. So one thing that you can... that anthropologists and biologists use for a reliable in indicator of health or nutrient availability is height. So the average height of a Paleolithic or pre-farming man was almost 5'10", right? That I think might actually be higher than um, a lot of the average height in modern societies. Anyways, it's, it's ballpark. However, um, once humans started farming and stopped hunting and gathering, this average height dropped by seven inches, um, which boys, that's a lot, right? Um, the average height of a late Neolithic farming man was 5'3". Okay, so although they were eating more calories, the amount of nutrients they had in their diet decreased a lot. Okay, um, and I'm quoting uh, Pandora's seed here again. Neil, which is I guess a guy that uh, is a researcher in the field, suggested that diabetes rare among hunter-gatherers, is a physiological reaction to the sudden increase in easily available calories. All right, so there we have it, plain and simple. Uh, Non-insulin dependent or type 2 diabetes is so rare among small-scale populations that it is difficult to find a report of its prevalence in these groups, right? So hunter-gatherers really didn't have these metabolic disorders. Uh, <laughs> and then in 2020, 13% of all U.S. adults had diabetes. Um, that is unfortunate. Just goes to show. I mean, if it's type 1 diabetes, I can't speak on that, but type 2, which I think is the majority of cases, um, yeah, that's a bad indicator of how our diet has affected us. Uh, okay, so a second biological consequence that Wells talks about in his book is disease. So, hunter-gatherers mainly died due to traumatic injuries and acute infections associated with minor wounds, right? They didn't have antibiotics or penicillin or any of these things. 
So if you get a cut and it gets dirty, there's a good chance that uh, something bad might happen, right? But farming caused people to aggregate into small, densely populated areas, right? And if you're not hunting and gathering, you're not really exposing yourself as frequently to like other animals or you're not like running and jumping over rocks and chasing these things, right? You're, it's like a lot safer lifestyle. Um, but the trade-off is that you start to aggregate into small uh, settlements, right? Because um, everyone wants to be where the food is. And this increases the probability of disease spread, right? Um, and farming also meant no longer being nomadic. So then you start to get the buildup of excrement and other um, bad things in your irrigation or water supply. Uh, and this also, of course, uh, increases the amount of disease in the area. So non-nomadic farmers tend to tend to animals instead of hunting them, right? Uh, you might have like the cow or the goat that used for milk and you have the chickens, right? Um, so close proximity with animals in general tends to increase the chance of uh, novel zoonotic diseases, um, which zoonotic means that it jumps from an animal to a human, right? So, of course, if you're near animals, you're likely to get these uh, new diseases. So this chart is pretty interesting. So you have the amount of disease uh, on the y-axis, and then you have the three different types uh, of the solid, dotted, and uh, broken line. And then you have the time period on the, the x-axis, right? So trauma is the solid line, and you can see that the amount of people dying from trauma um, pre-Neolithic uh, Revolution, which is around 10,000 BC, uh, is the most obvious, right? It's the highest line. And then after the Neolith Neolithic Revolution in 10,000 BC, you get trauma going down. And instead, infectious disease kicks in. And then you can see that around um, a thousand years ago, when people started to like understand medicine, uh, <laughs> well, I don't even know, less than a thousand years ago, I guess, um, infectious disease starts to go down as well, right? Because we get antibiotics and other uh, treatments. And instead, you get the rise of chronic non-infectious disease. And by this, they mean metabolic diseases, right? Like obesity, hypertension, um, stroke, uh, things like this, right? Okay, so now I shift into the part two of the of the presentation, right? And of course, I was giving this presentation in front of like a group of what, 15, 20 people. So I could like stop and like have them ask questions and things like that. Um, obviously, it's not really a, a YouTube thing you can do. Uh, so in class, I gave a guided discussion and I shift from the biological side to the psychological, which again, personally, I think is more interesting. So uh, I also want to shift from talking about the, ne the Neolithic Revolution, which is the focus of Wells, to the Industrial Revolution and modern life. And, and although these events may seem different, they're really only different in degree. And the reason I say this is because um, both events simply uh, separate us from our species essence, our biology, like the, the environment that we're adapted to. Um, I guess I put a fancy German word in here. I don't know if I can pronounce that. Gattenschwächen. <laughs> All you Germans can correct my pronunciation. Uh, yeah, the Industrial Revolution is similar to the Neolithic Revolution uh, because they it alienates us from our species essence. Um, and also, um, a few of you in the audience might be picking up on the fact that I might be being a bit romantic, right? You might, you might charge me with... Um, saying, oh, you know, hunter-gatherer lifestyle, it's so dreamy, it's going to be easy, all we need to do is, like, go back to it. Um, I recognize the fact that it's very difficult. <laughs> uh, the It's a hard lifestyle. But the difference is that the, the hunter-gatherer traditional lifestyle presents humans with challenges that we're adapted to deal with. Okay? It's not easier, but it's it presents us with the challenges that we're adapted to deal with. And the modern lifestyle presents us with difficulties that we are not adapted to deal with. And this causes like mental health issues, right? Um, so the first part of the guided discussion, uh, I had people group into small groups and then come up with possible, possible psychological consequences for modern life uh, in comparison with hunter-gatherer lifestyle. Um, and think about the consequences of things like technology, materialism, governments, okay? Um, so if you wanted to do a little brainstorming, you can pause the video 
uh, and then I'll go over it with you. Okay, uh, that was your opportunity. <laughs> so, here's a quote from the book on the psychological side. Um, although he does focus mostly on the biology, he does still have um, some about this. So, Wells states that psychological disorders such as depression and anxiety are also on the rise, and drugs to treat these disorders are now the most widely prescribed in the U.S. Is there some sort of fatal mismatch between Western culture and our biology that is making us ill? Okay. Um, now, here's a quote from your favorite essay. Uh, Imagine a society that subjects people to conditions that make them terribly unhappy, and then gives them drugs to take away their unhappiness. The increasing rate of depression is certainly the result of some conditions that exist in today's society. Instead of removing the conditions that make people depressed, modern society gives them antidepressant drugs. In effect, excuse me, antidepressants are a means of modifying an individual's internal state in such a way as to enable him to tolerate social conditions that he would otherwise find intolerable. Right? That's gold right there. So, I wanted to talk about the difference between small-scale and organization-dependent technology, um, which again uh, comes from this essay if you're interested. So, uh, Small-scale technology is things that you can make at home, okay? Um, like a chair, right? You could go into the forest, get some wood, and chop it up, and with a few basic tools, you can make a chair, okay? Um, I think metal counts as well for this, right? Like if you make want to make a nail, you could go out. I mean, this might be a bit more difficult, but it's possible, right? You can go out, uh, get metal, heat it up in a bowl, I don't know how you make a nail, hammer it down or whatever. Um, I mean, they were, they were making swords and daggers back in the day. You know, not not, not impossible. Um, and then organization-dependent technology is things that you could not conceivably create at home. So these are things like fridges or computers because they have all sorts of these crazy chemicals and uh, elements in them and they're so small, there's no way you can make it, right? Um, and the reason this is an important difference is because organization-dependent technology creates dependency, right? And further alienates us from our biology, right? Try to think, could you survive on a week's worth of groceries or even a two weeks worth of groceries if you didn't have your fridge, right? I mean, there are ways to do it, right? There, you can dehydrate, you can can, um, you can pickle, uh, you can use salt, but these skills have, are being lost, right? Because we can just use the fridge, it's way more convenient. So it creates dependency, right? And I probably don't need to convince you of the fact that you've <laughs> developed dependency for your electronic devices like computer or phone, right? Um, so you can think about that. So uh, yeah, I have their office jobs, social media. I guess these are sort of just more things that alienate us from our biology. I don't know why I put that there. Uh, anyways, oh, more quotes. Okay, so in regards to industrialization, here's another quote from Pandora's Seed. In effect, people started to merge with their machines, spending their whole lives performing repetitive tasks that, while wonderful at produ producing large quantities of standardized, inexpensive goods, effectively robbed the average factory worker of his or her individuality and creativity, right? So think about it before. Um, before the Industrial Revolution, uh, people generally had a, like a trade, right? Um, and if you were, say, like a shoemaker or a stonemason or a blacksmith, you would apprentice somebody most likely your father or uncle, and you had a large degree of freedom and creativity, right? Because as long as you were producing goods, you could sell them or trade them, and they were worth something. Um, now, uh, if you work in a factory, I guess, you're still making like a, a useful thing, but you do the same task over and over, and it really robs that person who's working there from that ability to create something on their own, you know? Um, and I think that's important uh, because it sort of rob, yeah, like, just like the quote says, it robs you of your individuality and creativity um, because you're kind of just doing the same thing over and over again. Um, I also have a quote here from a controversial figure, uh, but what he says here is absolutely correct. And he says that owing to the extensive use of machinery and to division of labor, the work of the proletarians has lost all individual character. Right? That's exactly what Wells said. 
uh, and consequently all charm for the workman. He becomes an appendage of the machine, and it is only the most simple, most monotonous, and most easily acquired knack that is required of him. Uh, so yeah, basically just echoing the same sentiment. Uh, next up is materialism. Okay, So I think I mentioned this sort of previously, uh, is that because of the semi-nomadic lifestyle, hunter-gatherers can't really hoard possessions, right? Um, uh, it's not like a Minecraft inventory. You can't carry that much stuff, right? You can only have a few things uh, that you get carry with you. Uh, so the focus is on survival. Uh, and because you don't have all these things to spend all your time worrying about, uh, you spend a lot more time with your family and making sure you're in the right uh, in the right with the gods, right? Spiritual piety um, in terms of r r rituals, ceremonies, things like that. Also, uh, as well, you have sedentary agricultural lifestyle in large cities that allows people to focus on fame, money, possessions, power, etc. Right? Um, because once you can hoard possessions and hoard money, um, I mean, there's all sorts of uh, implications with that. And these things like money, power, fame, I mean, you could pull any number of quotes from famous people uh, in Hollywood or whatever that saying that it doesn't make you happy. It's not, that's not the point of life. And, but why is that, right? I mean, everyone knows that money is not going to make you happy, or I hope you do. Um, but why is that? Uh, and of course, under this framework that I'm presenting to you, the reasons are evolutionary. Uh, next up, we have urbanization and bureaucratization, right? So urbanization is moving into cities, and bureaucratization is um, explicitly laying out the ways in which people... Uh, interact with like societal rules and services, right? So an example of this might be um, previously, if you wanted to have a party in your neighborhood, you just invite people over and make some food, right? But if you live in a city, now you have to apply for a permit to have this block party and you gotta, you know, go through all these, this red tape and paperwork just to make this happen, right? Um, nobody likes that. So, before we started farming, uh, in the Paleolithic lifestyle, we had well-defined, distinct roles in small, tight-knit communities. Uh, and then, post-farming, we have highly structured jobs, which I talked about before, cogs in a machine, surrounded by thousands of people. Uh, Dunbar's number is a biology thing, don't worry about that. Um, and these two things, urbanization and bureaucratization, they're similar to industrialization in that they both contribute to loss of individual identity and purpose. Um, because, I mean, that's sort of the definition of bureaucracy, right? Bureaucracy is impersonal, um, which is, again, unhealthy for people's mental health. So I had a second question here for people in the group discussion. Uh, I asked them to uh, think about this. Of course, asking everyone to give up modern luxuries and return to hunting and gathering is unreasonable. But no one's going to go for that. So with this in mind, what would it look like for us to reconcile our lifestyle choices with our evolutionary past? Alright, if you want to brainstorm that question, feel free to pause the video. Moving on. Uh, so Wells actually offers a solution at the end of his book. Um, he calls it wanting less. And the two main things that he suggests is are downsizing, right? Like buying smaller houses. Um, not having so many things, uh, and then also buying less, right? So not wasting your money because when you spend money, you need more money and then you work more, right? Um, so he wants us to like stop being consumers. Uh, however, I mean, these are great sol solutions. I like that, but it's also long-term and vague, right? He doesn't really offer any specific lifestyle suggestions, which is what people need, right? People, <laughs> people need to be told what to do. <laughs> uh, so what can we do today to reconcile our lifestyle with our biology. So, beyond wells. On the biology side, here are some things I would suggest to you. Changing your diet, okay? Eat less processed food. <laughs> That's literally the best rule of thumb you can have. Um, and if you're a man, eat more protein. Uh, also, start exercising, okay? Um, in terms of exercise, you want to do maybe, uh, for men, anyways, I can't give advice for women. I don't really have much experience in that. Um, but for men, you're going to want to do uh, at least one 
long term cardio a week, like where you swim or run or row or whatever for over an hour, um, you're going to want to do one or two hit workouts a week, right? That's high intensity intervals, get your heart pumping, red line, you know, um, and you're going to want to do weightlifting as well, resistance training, uh, and stretch as well. Come on guys, keep care, take care of yourself, stretch. Um, personally, a great way that I've found to in incorporate all those things is, uh, wrestling or jujitsu. Um, so highly recommend doing some no gi jujitsu, find a gym near you, I can guarantee there is one. Um, next I had holistic or folk medicine, right? Um, this sort of ties into the diet because before we started farming, we were eating all sorts of things, right? In the forest, like these herbs and, uh, these different plants that all had medicinal properties and all of these, uh, different molecules that were in these plants, we're not really getting them anymore, right? Um, either they're lost in processing or we just don't eat those foods anymore. So, um... Yeah, look into that as well. And then there's this concept called deep ecology, um, which has to do with sustainability and First Nations knowledge. Um, just, yeah, just changing the way that we interact with our environments. Um, so we're not like destroying things and like putting concrete everywhere. <laughs> kind of the obvious stuff. Um, and then on the psychology side, uh, there's a few more, right? So unplugging. This is a huge one. I advocate for this a lot, right? Um, limit your internet time, get a flip phone, get rid of your smartphone. That thing is terrible for you. I have a whole video on that. Um, social media, uh, it takes advantage of your psychology, hacks your brain to get you addicted, and um, it's not good for you. So that's also in my cell phone video. Uh, make decisions that make you more independent, right? Um, of course, uh, this isn't a conspiracy theory. Uh, the people in charge of our societies want us to be better consumers, um, so we spend more money uh, and get them richer. And the ways they do that is they make us more uh, dependent, more weak, fearful, um, and less competent. Right. So if you're strong and independent, um, they don't want that. Uh, so usually that's how you know it's a good thing that you should be doing. <laughs> so uh, and also being independent comes with being competent and having this. Uh, sense of self self competency is that the right word self efficacy and that's super healthy for you mentally right uh, also take time to slow down uh, I think a few videos ago I just talked about this um, how important it is to not be busy all the time take time to be bored take time to be with your thoughts um, harder to, to do nowadays but super important uh, buying less right of course um, this is what Wells suggested, but it's good, so I stole it. Uh, thank you, Wells. Yeah, stop being a consumer, stop buying things, and if you have to buy something, buy it used. Uh, go to a thrift store. Um, it'll save you money, and usually the things that were built uh, 50 years ago are <laughs> built to last, and uh, there, there was not as much planned obsolescence back then, so it's probably a better product anyways. Uh, and if you can, try not to buy plastic stuff, okay? Buy real materials, like metal or wood or ceramic, right? Try not to buy plastic stuff, please. Uh, and then also switch to small scale technology, right? So if you can, bike or walk instead of driving. Um, I'm trying to think of other examples. You might do this. I'm sure I had some great ones when I gave this presentation the first time. No, I can't think of them. Uh, anyways, yeah, switch to small scale technology if you can. Uh, and then one last point I put at the bottom here is that you have to recognize that our biology and psychology are very intimately connected, right? So, I mean, you know this, right? If you eat bad, you feel bad, <laughs> right? That's like the most obvious example um, that how your biology can impact your psychology. And the same is true the other direction, right? I have a video titled um, your, your Mind is Powerful or something like that. And that's the whole idea that the, the way that you perceive the world and think about the world actually impacts the world that you live in, right? Um, so this has biological implications for health, uh, as well as, uh, I guess health is the main one, but emotions as well, right? Which I guess is more psychology, but yeah, don't neglect the fact that it's very connected. So don't just do one of them. You gotta do both. So coming back to what I said at the beginning of the video, um, I want to recap my central argument. Okay. 
My central argument is that modern life is bad because it disconnects us from the environments and lifestyle we are adapted to. And in order to live a happy, fulfilling life, we need to reconnect with our evolutionary past in a holistic way. And this might look different for different people, but come on, seriously think about it. And not just think about it. Make actionable decisions. Um, and I left a lot out of this presentation. So if you start going down the rabbit hole and doing research, you're going to find about a whole lot of other things about how um, humans were basically awesome before they started farming and then um, became weak and stupid <laughs> after they started uh, farming. So there's things like declines in general intelligence, loss of vital self-sufficiency skills. This is super sad because that's knowledge we can't get back unless we start living that life again and just rediscover them, I guess. Um, so, so many self-sufficiency skills lost. Um, there's genetic shifts, right? Increases in mutational load. Um, you biologists would know about that. Uh, a lot of loss of religion and myth and the role they play in our lives um, has gone by the wayside in modern societies. And there's tons of other things, right? So, yeah, those are my sources. You can pause the video if you want to uh, look any of those up. But, yeah, that's it. So thanks for listening. Um, I hope you learned something because this is important to me. So yeah, let me know what you think in the comments. Have a good day.